George. Um, look, I'd like to invite my panelists up to the stage immediately. Uh, this is a big topic. We've only got one hour, and let's be honest, artificial intelligence is a topic where we could talk about it for a whole three-day conference and probably not cover all of the issues. Um, I think the phrase artificial intelligence has come up a number of times already today. It's come up in the, uh, in the creative day yesterday, if you were here. Um, it's really starting to, to get traction across so many areas in, in society. So uh, we're lucky enough today to have um, three of the thought leaders in Australia to, to join us on stage. Uh, um, I'll just introduce them quickly and uh, drill down a little deeper. We've got Toby Walsh uh, from uh, Data6 and University of New South, New South Wales. Uh, Marianne Williams, who uh, works at UTS, and the Magic Lab, which sounds awesome. Uh, I'm going to ask more about that. And then Joanna Batstone, who's at IBM. Um, and I'll drill down into uh, where the, what their sort of areas of expertise are in a moment. But um, just to give you an idea of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to cover a little bit about um, the current state of, of artificial intelligence and uh, the developments that have happened and where, where we're at at the moment. Um, and then sort of have a look, a peek into what, where we're headed. Um, and this is the area where it can get a little bit tricky because if you believe Hollywood, uh, we all might die at the hands of killer robots, but who knows where that's headed. Um, but before we get started and I start to uh, uh, get the discussion going, is anyone in the room working at the moment actively in artificial intelligence, whether it's research and development or commercial applications or anything? Well, one person so far, <laughs> apart from those on the stage, okay. Um, as a, just in general, if, if you were catching up with friends, do you think uh, that you would have um, the ability to talk about the pros and cons of whether artificial intelligence and where it's headed uh, is, is a good thing or a bad thing? Put your hand up if you, if you think you're well enough informed in, in that area. So we've got a few people who, yeah, that's, that's good. Probably, probably more, more than I thought. Well, we're going to start to, to ask some questions here of our experts on stage. So I'll, um, I think I'll start with, um, with Joanna at the, at the other end. Um, Joanna, really glad to have you here. Um, Joanna works at IBM. Um, I'll get her to introduce uh, what she does there. But um, obviously, IBM have been pioneers when it comes to artificial intelligence and uh, going back a, a long way. Um, and one of the interesting discussions that we've had leading up to this is the difference potentially between cognitive technology and artificial intelligence. So perhaps, Joanna, if you want to give a bit of a, an intro into your role at IBM and, and, and that distinction. Yeah, thanks very much. So our research labs here in Melbourne uh, have a focus on what we call cognitive computing, uh, and in, which, which leverages artificial, artificial intelligence technologies, machine learning technologies, but with the application of those technologies primarily to the health and life sciences area. And we're focused on moving from a world where you can program computers uh, to a world where computers can learn and react and uh, interact with uh, people in human-related tasks. So in the context of medical research, we're very interested in how can you deploy technologies as cognitive assistants. For example, could you have a cognitive radiology assistant? So within the lab in Melbourne, we've got a lot of focus on health and life sciences. And this is against a backdrop of having a number of labs around the world, uh, including the labs in New York, where we developed what some people know of as the Jeopardy computer that became our, our Watson computer and the set of Watson technologies. And so we've taken some of that basic a question and answering technology that we had to develop to, to win the game of Jeopardy, and now we're uh, deploying it to a, a number of industry domains, uh, health and life sciences, oil and gas, education. Fantastic. Um, Marianne, I, I, I do have to ask the Magic Lab. What goes on at the Magic Lab? Because that sounds like a great place to work. Uh, what, what are you uh, contributing out of the Magic Lab? Well. We, we all know that uh, you know, any advanced, sufficiently advanced technology you know, is, is like magic. So you know, we're very much at the forefront of AI technologies, and we're Australia's leader in social robotics. So what we do is design and develop robot behaviors that uh, help the robots um, display social behaviors. I mean, we don't want robots today or 
particularly the future, to be psychopathic or to suffer from, you know, um, sort of mental deficiencies of any kind. We want them to be caring and loving and helpful. I'm going to sing uh, Marianne's praises a little because, because actually I don't think many people in the audience will know, but, but Australia is actually one of the world leading nations in robots. We are currently the ro reigning uh, robot football champions and we've won five times. Marianne has done very well in the robot competitions herself. So um, it's actually we're, uh, a little, uh, yeah. well, little known secret that uh, yeah. Australia <laughs> punches well above its weight. Which yeah, is better even than the soccer So with, with human well, sports and robot sports. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have to punch above our weight. <laughs> um, and Toby, that's probably a good segue into you, because I and we'll come back to this topic because I know you've you've written an open letter about um, autonomous weapons and, and things, which we'll come back to. But um, in terms of your field of domain, when it when it comes to artificial intelligence, I know you're interested in in deep learning and and um, those computational sciences. So do you just want to give a bit of an overview in, in terms of what you do with Data sixty one and and UNSW? Yes, yeah, so, so Data sixty one is is um, the synthesis between uh, what was what was originally uh, NICTA and uh, CSIRO's digital productivity flagship, um, and it's interested in all things uh, data. I mean, data is eating the world, and the algorithms that go with that data, and um, deep learning is one aspect of it. Something that I spend a lot of my time on is looking at optimization, looking at um, not just the prediction side of things, but actually the decision-making side of things. How do you actually get computers to make good decisions? How do you actually improve the efficiency of your operations. And without going too far into it, what, what is the current um, methodology for improving those systems? Uh, some smart AI algorithms where <laughs> the computer is doing, you know, considering a lot of the possibilities, but many more possibilities that, that you or I could do. I mean, you know, often we go into a business and the, you'll say, well, how are you solving the problem today? And they say, well, we've got this um, spreadsheet or we've got this whiteboard. And, uh, you know, the computer can sit down and, and enumerate many more possibilities and, and do it in a smart way. It's not just brute force. It's also trying to look at, you know, you ask the experts, well, you know, what were the tricks? What were the heuristics? What were the rules of thumb that you were using that allowed you to come up with a good dis decision? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you apply the, the power of the, the, the algorithms and, and the fact that the computer can process so much more data and collect in so much more data, you can come up with better decisions and improve the efficiency of your operations. Yeah, and I guess to, to that point, and maybe coming back to you, Joanna, um, uh, you referenced, you know, when Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov in chess back in 1997, that was heralded as, a, as quite a breakthrough achievement. That's, that's nearly 20 years ago now. Um, and then Watson has sort of now superseded it as the, the poster child from, from an IBM point of view. What have, what have you seen as the main drivers recently for, you know, we've seen a lot of investment recently going into AI technologies, a lot of startups, um, all of the big corporates are, have got AI divisions now. What, what's sort of driving that from your perspective? I think some of the drivers are that we're, we're starting to see real business benefit associated with some of these technologies. So teaching a computer to play chess teaching a computer to win Jeopardy, teaching a computer to win Go. These games enable us to advance the state of the art on algorithms, both machine learning, deep learning techniques. And now we're seeing really this transformation where there's real business value. So I mentioned medical research. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing is looking at how do you develop a series of algorithms that would teach a computer how to understand and interpret medical images. So moving from the world of text to the world of vision, moving from the world of text to the world of video and medical images, uh, these games and the, the advances in the technology have really enabled us to get to the point now where you're seeing commercial application of technology. And that then spawns a huge amount of uh, university investment, business investment, uh, because we can now see the, the true commercial value of these technologies. And, and Marianne, from your perspective, um, look, looking at the robotics field, uh, how is that transitioning? I mean, robots aren't new in industry. They've, they've, been, they've revolutionized the car industry many, many years ago and um, many other industries. It, what's the sort of the next frontier that you're seeing in, in that development? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the big transformation is autonomy. So uh, getting robots out of the factory where they're doing repetitive jobs and not really doing any sensing or making sense of their surroundings, but uh, allowing them to be free and untethered and interacting uh, with people. So I think this has captured a lot of um, business and, and people's imagination. And uh, since innovation is really the driver, it's not just business value today, it's really how am I gonna stay in business in the future, uh, that these robotic technologies are, um, I think, very attractive, but also because that technology is actually available, uh, consider a drone is less than $1,000, people can play. And I think that's, you know, introduces a lot of excitement. Mm. I think another really critical thing is we have the data today. So that all of us are walking around with smartphones in our pocket. We're collecting all this data um, and we've got fast, better robots, we've got faster computers, um, and we've got better AI algorithms as well. And so the synthesis of those three things, the better data, the better computing power, um, and the better algorithms that we're starting to develop mean that suddenly the technologies are really finding you know, traction. I think that's a really important point because what is a robot? It's a data gathering device that can move around and importantly with autonomy decide what data it wants to collect all by itself. I think the other element is the huge explosion of data. 80% um, of the world's data is probably unstructured. It's coming from the smartphones in our pockets, it's coming from the sensors in smart buildings. Uh, and it's, it's much more data than you can really imagine. And hence, you have to get to this world of autonomy and systems that can learn and adapt to how to interpret the data and learn from behavioral changes in those data sets. So it's a combination of the state of the art of the algorithm advancing, plus this huge explosion of data. So one of the things that we've discussed in sort of in the lead up to this session is um, sort of the, the fact that a number of these technologies have probably been around for some time. They're only just starting to become mainstream or be becoming known to the public. And um, to what extent is, is the um, sort of law of accelerating change in technology, that, that kind of movement uh, sort of starting to exponentially change this shift in, in the way that um, advancements in artificial intelligence I is moving? I'll throw it back to you, Joanna. I think as, as technology changes, where you see these rapid advancements, it's because you've reached a threshold where now you can accomplish something meaningful. So when, when we first built the chess computer, uh, Deep Blue, uh, getting to the point where we could win a game of chess was a major milestone that then opened up a range of other applications. I think what we're seeing now with the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning is we've reached those thresholds where we can enable the computers to do real work in real time and become autonomous assistants. I mean, we would tend to call them cognitive assistants. It's augmented human intelligence. And the, the symbiosis of the human and the machine enables us to accomplish much more. And as we reach those thresholds, you see rapid acceleration in technology adoption. So that's probably a good segue into sort of starting to look at um, where things are headed in terms of this technology and, and, and the future state. And, uh, it, there's been so much written about this and uh, you know, people are calling it the fourth industrial revolution, the fact that we've now uh, reaching this technological age where we're seeing so many advances taking place so quickly. And there are a number of sort of social and ethical ramifications of that. You know, joblessness, one, one of the fears is that um, we, we're gonna have mass displacement of people from, from their jobs. So, um, you know, Toby, I might, throw back to you, um, where do you see that kind of, how, how, do, how do you see society dealing with that type of change if, if artificial intelligence is starting to take over those types of tasks that ordinarily would have been, been done by humans before? I think the, the impact that artificial intelligence and robotics and technology in general is gonna have on workforce is pro pro possibly one of the greatest ones that's going to be impacting our society in the next 20 years. Um, that it's, it's really difficult to say to people, you know, what should you go to university to study? Because you're going to come out of university and in 20 years' time, you're going to be working in a job 
using a technology that doesn't exist today. Um, it really is going to transform the, not only the work we do, but also what jobs are actually available. And many jobs will disappear, for sure. Many new jobs will be created. It's a really interesting question uh, whether more jobs get destroyed than created. In the past, in the last Industrial Revolution, that was the case. I mean, the, the level of unemployment today around the world is lower than it was then, and we have a significantly bigger population. So clearly we've invented a lot more jobs. It's not clear that there, there, there's, no, there's no law of economics that demands that has to be the case. Mm. Um, and you know, the world changed in a big way last time. We, we um, introduced lots of laws to protect workers' rights so that they weren't exploited by the people who own the means of production. Um, we're going through similar transformations already today. Mm. Well, some people have argued that perhaps one way of dealing with that is having a basic minimum income for, for people to, to deal with that kind of displacement. Is that, is that a way of dealing with this, or is that going to potentially uh, put off those who are trying to advance these types of technology? Uh, that's not a question to ask any of us three, because we're technologists. That's a <laughs> question to go and ask economists, uh, psychologists, politicians, and ultimately to our society. Yes. Uh, that's a question we as a society, you, have to decide, you know, how do we look after, how do we make, there's a, there's a lovely quote going around at the moment, how do we make sure that we all benefit from this rising tide, not just the people who own the yachts? But, but I mean, we have seen these sort of waves of change before. Uh, consider the finance industry, you know, a lot of white collar jobs simply disappeared. So people do have the edge on robots and uh, AI technologies, um, I think for the foreseeable future. and. Our main advantage, okay, is just our adaptability and our social skills. So if you're doing work that is very repetitive and uh, could easily be automated, uh, the kinds of decisions you make are very structured, of course an AI system can disintermediate you. So um, my advice is just <laughs> simply to find those jobs uh, that a robot would find difficult, and that is any job where you need to uh, be adaptable, and in particular, interact with people. That's what robots won't be doing for quite some time. Uh, can, I, can I add to that? I think, you know, I, I agree completely with everything you said there. I think you either, you either got to be inventing the future, or so, you know, be a technologist like us, um, <laughs> so we'll be safe. Uh, alternatively, as you suggest, be in the most people-facing, uh, outwardly creative profession that you can be, because those are going to be things that the computer's going to struggle with most. So, you know, it's either one end of the spectrum, don't get caught in the middle, uh, where your job will be automated. Um, I want to come back to something that I referenced slightly earlier. Um, there was a, a couple of interesting things that happened last year in artificial intelligence around some, some of the concerns. Um, and it, it started off in January last year when there was an, an open letter put out by the, the Future of Life Institute, where it was an open letter suggesting that um, now is the right time to be investing in research as to where this technology is headed because uh, if we proceed too far down the track, it might be too late to, to turn things around. Now, you know, th this letter, open letter was signed by the likes of Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, some pretty you know, clever cl thinkers when it comes on to, the, to the world stage. Um, to what extent, and then, and then later in the year, Toby, there was, there was one that you were involved with um, talking about um, autonomous weapons and, um, and again, just, just putting a, a curb on, uh, well, not a curb, but at least making it aware of, what, of what's going on in this area. Um, perhaps perhaps I'll, I'll come back to the first one. Um, Joanna, what, what's your take on this, this idea that now is the time that we should be starting to think about these repercussions that might be happening 20, 30 years down, down the track before it gets too late. I think the IBM Watson labs were also involved in that discussion as well around the future of these technologies. Um, one, of, one of the key points is ultimately whether the computer ends up being in a decision-making mode or as a consultant assistant mode. And a lot of where we see the technology advancing today is very much in the consultant assistant as opposed to autonomous decision maker. Um, and that's, that's the, the way that we're looking at this for the future, that it is very much this notion of augmented intelligence as opposed to taking the control and the decision away from the human partner 
in, in the decision making. And, and that's very much the direction that we're taking as we advance the technology, is this very much this partnership between the human and the technology, or the human and the robot, so that it's a, a concierge assistant, or um, an engineer's assistant, or a clinician's assistant with this augmented notion. Um, and so getting to the point where you get computers truly to be making all of the decisions, I think that's a long way away. And I think society is going to be very cautious about getting to that point, which is why we very much take the point that this is the, the assistant, the cognitive assistant. Mm. And, and Toby, what, what um, drove you to, to write that open letter about autonomous weapons? So I, I'll come back, I just, I just want to pick, pick up the, the theme there, the more existential concerns that people are having, as opposed to the more, the more I think, immediate day-to-day -day concerns about things like autonomous weapons is that it's actually, it's not artificial intelligence. I think people make, there's a common confusion made here. It's not artificial intelligence that is the problem that we should be worrying about. It's autonomy. Because it's, you can build an AI system and the smarter it is actually, the less likely it is to cause us any problems. But it's the fact that we may give it auto autonomy that is actually the challenge. I mean, we're seeing this today with, with uh, autonomous vehicles. People are starting to say, wait a second, there are some really significant ethical questions to do around you know, autonomous vehicles. Because you know, there's an accident going to happen. Who are they going to drive into? Are they going to drive into the pedestrians crossing the road? Or are they going to drive into the brick wall and kill the driver? There's really challenging questions. Those only come about because you've given the system autonomy. Mm. Uh, and the smarter it is, the, e the better it will get out of those situations, um, making the right decision. Um, so you know, it's actually stupid AI that I fear most. And that's, <laughs> that, that brings us back to this, this uh, this, uh, I, so I should say I signed the first letter um, as well as help put together the second letter on autonomous weapons, which is that, is that here we're talking about very simple technologies, um, sort of technologies that are at best a, a few years away that will be entering the battlefield if we, don't, if we permit them to happen. And the, the military are very keen for, for a number of very obvious reasons to, to um, field these sorts of technologies, some, some of which are you know, actually pretty much in the lab today. Um, and it will, uh, it will end in an arms race, and we will be on the receiving end of that arms race. And uh, I, it's myself and many other people came to the same conclusion. That was a very undesirable road to go down, and we should try and, and curb that before we got to that point. But unfortunately, that's impossible. Because uh, it's not the battlefields, it's the backyards, it's the do-it-yourselves, it's the teenagers in Connecticut who connect a handgun to a drone and shoot it off. A 3D printed uh, handgun. It, it's, it's wonderful. You, you, you turn on YouTube, you will see people putting you know, guns into the hands of, of drones. And that, those are almost always entries for the Darwin Award. They, <laughs> those people demonstrate the, the effectiveness of those weapon systems at killing themselves. So I have very little concern about those sorts of weapon systems. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, at the end of the day, this is going to be a, a really hard technology to, to, to legislate on because it's going to be very accessible, very cheap. And another reason why it's going to fall into the wrong hands. But, the, but you know, there are other fine examples of, of weapon systems that the world has come together. Uh, blinding lasers is, is probably the, the best example. Very simple, cheap technology. The, the world came together and said, it's probably better not to be fighting wars, not to allow blinding lasers into the battlefield, and no arms company today will sell you a blinding laser, despite the fact that when the legislation came into place in 97, Two arms companies, one US, one Chinese, had announced that they were going to be selling blinding lasers. And if you go to the battlefields of Syria and elsewhere today, people are not being blinded with lasers. I think the world is probably a better place for it. So those lasers I saw in Shanghai last year, they're not blinding? They're, you, they, go, you go into the hospital uh, in, in Melbourne, you get your eyes blinded by a laser, uh, so blinding lasers exist. Technology is not, no one's suggesting you have to, you can uninvent technology. It's pretty much the same technology that's going to go into your autonomous car. It's going to go into your autonomous uh, weapon system. You know, it's going to be able to track uh, and guide itself and find targets. Um, you're not going to uninvent the technology. The question is, are you going to allow arms companies to sell it? Is it going to become the Kalashnikov of the battlefield? To, tomorrow, are you going to make it difficult? Um, the good thing is, today, still, uh, organizations like ISIS, still actually rather relatively primitive. They don't actually you know, develop much technology themselves. Um, I think probably we'd be better off not allowing arms companies to build this sort of technology. 
Yeah, but they're, they're you know, repurposing mobile phones to set you know, bombs off. The, this technology is very accessible. And it is. Let's not make it any more accessible than it is. Okay. And, and well, to, to your point, it is hard to legislate for this. And I know, Marianne, you, you, you've also got a law, law degree as well. And it, it, this type of, for, from a government point of view, uh, how hard is this to try and wrap, wrap some kind of governmental regulation system around? Yeah, well, I mean, has everybody noticed that uh, we're in range of North Korea? Uh, you know, international laws around war and warfare, I think, are very challenged even today with today's technology, let alone the future. I, I, I'm going to continue the debate here, I'm sorry. It's, it's too easy to put your head in the sand here. There are, there are lots of you know, precedent, historical precedents here. Um, chemical weapons. Chemical weapons are actually dead cheap to make. It doesn't take actually much of a chemistry degree to work out how to make chemical weapons. We have legislation, international legislation against chemical weapons. Um, it hasn't stopped chemical weapons being used 100%. It has no doubt limited their use. There is enough stigma used by them. People who use them do get, you know, do realize that, you know, the various courts will be coming after them. They will, uh, you know, the stigma associated has made the world probably a slightly safer place. There are a lot less battles fought with the chemical weapons. Um, it's probably a good thing, and I think the same will, will, will be true of, of uh, autonomous weapons. We're not, gonna, we're not going to uninvent the technology. The technology will be there. The question is whether there's the stigma associated with it to limit and reduce the amount that, that we will be on the receiving end of such technologies, because it is uh, innocent civilians, that, uh, the, 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 the bystanders that, that will be uh, terrorized by these weapons, and they will be terrorful weapons. So, um, moving away from the sort of the autonomous weapon side of things, but also still, <laughs> still looking at the, the, the possibilities of where this technology might go in the future, one of the other um, hypotheses is that we might at some point, 10, 20, 30 years down the track, see some kind of intelligence explosion. So we might have um, an artificial intelligence that is um, recursively self-learning. So, and some people have called it an artificial superintelligence. There are a number of different different terms for this. Um, I guess one of the, the the questions here is, and and maybe Joanne, I'll, I'll get your thoughts on this from a from a technology point of view. If if you are ethically trying to build a a system that um, is self-learning but does the right thing, how, how do you go about doing that, that type of thing? So a lot of this is um, most of the systems that learn, right, we describe systems that can learn supervised and unsupervised. And a lot of supervised learning today involves building training sets of trusted data sets that you can train a system on and then the system learns and then can continue to learn based on experience. So the ethics of this are very much around choosing the domain and choosing the data sets on which you want to train a system um, and then applying it. So, so getting to the point where we truly get to unsupervised learning without training sets, that's, that's a technology advance. We, we can see some evidence that we're heading in that direction. Most uh, AI and machine learning, deep learning experiences are based on building what we would call a curated, trusted, annotated data set. And that becomes what we'd call your ground truth. That, that's the basis on which you teach the system. And then it has to learn on top of that. Hmm. And do I dare use the term singularity? Is, is, that, is that a dirty word in, in artificial intelligence circles? I know. For, yes. For <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I think it is. I think actually you look at the, most of the people who talk about a technological singularity, this idea that will make computers sufficiently intelligent that they'll be able to redesign themselves. Those systems will then redesign themselves and this will be a, a snowballing effect. That at, so, at some point, you know, technology will just get away from us and we'll just, uh, that will end up with systems that are far more intelligent than us uh, as a result. That is something that, that that people like Ray Kurzweil and Nick Bostrom, people who are not working in AI talk about. People who work, most people who, maybe, maybe Mary's gonna disagree in a second, people who are working in AI, uh, <laughs> myself uh, uh, certainly, uh, have quite a lot of healthy skepticism about this. Um, 
For one thing, it completely confuses the idea of your intelligence at a task and your ability uh, to do the task, uh, le learn how to do the task. There are two different things, wh whether you can do a task, learn how to do the task, and then learn how to improve your algorithm that learns how to do the task. When we, when we design machine learning algorithms, they get better at a particular domain. They never improve themselves as machine learning algorithms. They learn better to solve a particular domain. They, they top out typically at some point. They get to 98% performance and that's it. So you think you will have... Deep learning sort of has never produced a better deep learning algorithm. Okay. Humans have produced better deep learning algorithms. Ah. And people are proof of concept that singularity can happen. No, people are exactly <laughs> proof of concept that singularity doesn't happen. There is a very modest increase in our intelligence. It's called the Flynn effect. Our intelligence has increased at a very slow, at best, linear rate as we've been, been able to understand our brains. We haven't seen a takeoff. There is no takeoff. Is, is that there. limited by our hardware or is that limited by the software inside our brains? To, to use the, the analogy. We can learn, you know, the, the psychology and uh, educational philosophy, uh, ed educational psychology, there's, you know, um, uh, uh, physiology of the brain, neurology. People have, you know, understand a lot more about the brain, yet we don't know how to actually make the brain that much better. It's still as painful to learn a foreign language now as it always was. That's because humans are so fallible. <laughs> no, the human brain is considered a, sort of uh, a major development from an evolutionary point of view. David Attenborough says so. <laughs> well, you are. Yeah, the human brain is absolutely remarkable. Yeah. There is nothing that approaches the, okay. the power of the human brain. Okay. With 20 watts of power to do all that, when Watson used uh, how many kilowatts? 20,000 kilowatts? Yeah. Right? Okay. You know, so, yeah, orders so, of magnitude more energy. So, so let me finish then. I mean, <laughs> we, mankind used to think that uh, the Earth was the center of the universe, right? People are not that special. We can recreate people and build them in, in a different way. Uh, I mean, what you see before you, all right, just look around, is created in your head. There are no colors in the world, all right? There are different wavelengths of light, but what you see is created in your head a few microseconds after it's actually happened. There is no reason why singularity is not going to happen for other technologies. We are just a technology. I think, I think Joanne yeah, has so I'd like, I'd like to comment on actually the role of the brain and understanding the role of the brain in this whole dialogue around artificial intelligence. Because you asked earlier, right, what are some of the drivers? Why is there so much interest right now? Um, and again, I mentioned it's technology disruptions. As we understand more about the brain, one of the things that's now happening is we're starting to design new computer architectures that are modeled from the way that the brain functions in terms of neurons and synapses and information flow within the brain. And so new computer architectures are emerging. It's often called brain-inspired computing or neuromorphic computing. And these new computer architectures, if you then put uh, neural nets and deep learning technologies onto those new computer architectures, you can then start to look at, well, could you build technology that is as good at pattern recognition as the human is, right? Picking the face out of the crowd or identifying a feature in an image or a video. And so you're starting to see special purpose uh, compute infrastructure that's going to be really good at special function. Pattern recognition is an obvious one because that's what we're so good at. And so, so understanding the brain and our improved knowledge of neuroscience, I think, is also one of the drivers that's going to change the world of artificial intelligence in the future. And, and could that be another step change in... Because uh, in doing some reading about this topic, it, there's, they call it sort of a, a bit of a winter in terms of AI development, you know, maybe 50... 15 years ago, there, thereabouts, and it, it seems to be every now and then there's this step change of, of something that ha comes along. So is that type of breakthrough going to lead to the next leap forward in, in where this technology can go? I think it will for specialized domains, um, certainly for, for images, right? A lot of AI uh, teaching is on textual information today. Um, being able to understand the visual world and develop 
um, algorithms and technologies for the visual world, I think we'll, we'll see those advances with new computer architectures as well. And, and it fundamentally comes down to, as you said, right, understanding how the brain is interpreting the world around us. If we can then turn that into an algorithmic view of the world, we'll advance the technology. Yeah. I mean, I think there's been a profound shift away from the ideas of the uh, AI winter. I mean, the AI winter was largely around you know, researchers uh, thinking they could write down all the rules that the brain follows to, to make a person. But I think we know that's wrong. Uh, the current era is really data-driven. It's all about the data. And so I think that even experts like us can't really see an end to that. It's just getting more and more sophisticated, more and more exciting, and more and more sort of feasible and realistic. And it, it, it just feels right, you know, because if you look at a, a person, we're gathering data through all of our senses and making sense of it. I mean, that's what our brain does. Yeah. So it seems to me that uh, we're on a trajectory uh, that will lead to the singularity. I, I'm going to still continue to disagree. So, I mean, one of the, one of the key points in the, the argument that people who believe in the singularity say is that, well, well of course, once we get, we get past human intelligence, then that's the tipping point. That's the point of where, you know, things are just going to start snowboarding, which I, I think is that really highly conceited human viewpoint, which is that our intelligence is some special point. It's not. It, first of all, it's not a point. There's a whole spectrum of intelligences that we have, so it's not, it's not clear whose intelligence we have to pass. Is it the average intelligence of the average person, or is it the smartest person on the planet? But just because we get past that point doesn't mean that then you have enough intelligence. I mean, it's, no one defines what, part of the problem is, no one defines what intelligence actually means. It's a very multifaceted thing that's so ill-defined. But it's, it's not that just when you get past that point you have enough intelligence, that you now have enough intelligence to improve your intelligence. That point could be way, way beyond there. And how are we ever going to get there? Because we'll never, you know, the computer's never going to be smart enough to, to redesign itself to do that. We may never be smart enough to do it. So it's not, there's no clear, obvious inevitability to the trajectory that, that we're going to be able to design systems so smart that they, can, that they can redesign themselves and take off. That might be some point so way beyond our intelligence and way beyond the intelligence of any systems that we can design that there will never be a singularity. So as opposed to, because a number of people argue that the reason we can't get there at the moment is that the computing power isn't quite there to match the, the amount of speed that we need to, to the amount of calculations per second that the human brain it, can do. It's not just speed. Intelligence is just not speed. We can't just turn the clock rate up. If you got a dog to think faster, he'll never play chess. <laughs> Intelligence is much more about other things. It's our experience. It's not just the speed with which you think. It's the quality of that, of that thought process as well. And it's the realization of the need to learn as opposed to, you know, you've programmed a system with information. It's this realization of learning that intelligence is also that ability to learn. So is it, to back to your point earlier, is it theoretically possible that you, you say at the moment um, a machine, uh, the deep learning can get better and better within a single domain and it might, it might be able to improve itself, but it won't take that step change to improve the algorithm across a sort of a general intelligence spectrum. Is there any theoretical barrier to that type of activity happening? So, I mean, a, a lot of respect to the, the, the deep learning team. Uh, so, uh, doing so well at Go, I mean, let, let, let's point out, for, first of all, that it was only the European champion at Go. Europe doesn't really play Go like the Chinese do, so we've still got some distance. But nevertheless, it was probably 10 years before almost anyone working in the field thought we'd get to that point in time. Yeah. So for those who don't know, um, do you want to explain just in the last week that what, what happened with... Yeah, so, so um, a, a program uh, written by uh, some, uh, the DeepMind team that was acquired by Google uh, beat the European champion at Go quite convincingly. And Go is an ancient Chinese... Go board is game. probably the Mount Everest of war games. Right? It is significantly harder than chess. If you look at the number of possible games of chess, you look at the branching of the number of possible moves you have to make, it doesn't come close to what you have to do in Go. In chess, you have to make uh, 20, you may make, make one of 20 moves at any point. In, in Go, it's a 19 by 19 
Best parts of human to play Go, and and despite the fact that I've been arguing extensively against the singularity, <laughs> I'm not arguing event against human uh, about computers getting at superhuman performance at a particular task. Go is going to be one of those tasks. Chess we've already done. Why Backgammon do you, we've why already do you done. Limit Jeopardy, it? Why done. do you limit it to? But we had to tasks. work hard to do at that. You, it's, they had to work hard to build the Alpha Go, the, the the Go playing program to play Go. They had to hand code the features. They threw in a lot of expert knowledge. Uh, Dennis Hassabiz uh, knows a lot about Go, plays Go himself. They threw in a lot of human knowledge about how you play Go to build the system. The system didn't learn itself. The, right. system, uh, the system was, you know, had a lot of hand coding, tweaking, specific to Go. You right. took that out and you, 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 you say, okay, play a game of chess now. It would play abysmal chess. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's really this, the same point about training sets. Yes. Right? That, that our, our systems that we build, we build them with training sets of data. So we can teach a, against a training set of the game of Go. We can teach against a training set of the world of finance or of the world of video images or YouTube videos or TED Talks. Uh, we can teach against a training set and then the machine will have the impression of, of superhuman intelligence because it's better than the human at that specialized purpose task. But it's the symbiosis of the relationship between the human and the computer that gets you to the point where you can win a game of Go or win the game of chess or win the game of Jeopardy. Uh, and the great thing about a game like Go is also you can get the computer to play itself and learn from playing itself. But, but this sounds like you know the 1980s when we thought that you know playing chess uh, or, or yeah, being able to play chess was being intelligent. Whereas today, I don't think we do. I mean, we think about emotional intelligence as being potentially even more important than kind of uh, the sort of old view of intelligence. So, you know, should we really be measuring progress uh, against human gains? We've robots have already superseded humans in so many areas. They can sense things way beyond us. They're much stronger. They can do so many superhuman things. So uh, I think that our disagreement about singularity is uh, not, I'm not arguing they can, robots will, or, or computers will be able to build themselves, but that they will reach sort of a point of, let's call it consciousness, all right? Where they're aware, they're aware of what they know and of other people and robots around them, and they may even have models of people's minds. Yeah. And this is actually a big challenge uh, in robotics, social robotics in particular, okay? Because it's, um, it's something called a theory of mind, it's something people do very easily. It's something we learn between about the, oh, well, up and around the ages of four and six. And it's the, also the reason we can lie. Have you ever noticed that little kids can't lie? That's because they haven't developed a theory of mind. They don't have a model of their parents' mind. They think everybody knows what they know. And so how can you lie if, to somebody if they know what you know? You can't. It's only later when you're five and six and you realize, wait a minute, my brothers and sisters or parents or whoever didn't know something I knew and then you learn to exploit that. And you know, that's when I think robots become really interesting, when they develop a theory when of mind. Lie. So they're gonna be bigger, stronger, have senses way beyond our own, and be able to deceive. Mm. Um, just before, on a journey, you wanted to add a comment. Um, we're about to start taking some questions. So for anyone who does have questions, um, there are two microphones on either side of the, the stage. So. Um, Joanna, if you want. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to your question. You know, is are playing board games right? Is is that really how we should be testing these technologies? Um, and I mentioned earlier, right? The the commercial applications are are changing the world. So if you've got uh, 
a system that can learn based on reams of medical literature the opportunity for new cancer treatments for an oncologist. Um, you're developing those techniques based on the work you've done playing the games. The games are helping you develop the techniques. But then you can apply it to the real world uh, situations. One of the areas of, that I think is interesting for robotics, you find particularly here for Australia, I think there's, there's a lot of interest in the oil and gas and mining space, that you can have uh, automation in mining operations to detect the likelihood of equipment breakdown and do autonomous upgrades and updates to equipment in the field. So the real industrial applications are where there's huge opportunity for robotics. So the games may seem on one hand superficial, we're playing a game, but the experience of learning how to play the game then enables us to take it into the real world. But, uh, I just want to say, I, I mean, it was great that Marianne brought up that dangerous C word. Um, and I think it uh, highlights... Con consciousness. A, uh, yes, consciousness. <laughs> uh, just, just clarify, Toby. It highlights, it highlights a, prob a, a problem, which is that people see advances in areas like you know, getting computers to play Go or, or winning Jeopardy, things like this. And then they think, well, well actually, that's, that's an intelligent activity. So computers are gonna, just about to take over. And we haven't begun to understand <laughs> consciousness, the theory of mind. And if, if you ask, I'm, I'm sure if I ask Marianne, it's, it, you know, we're 50, 100 years away from being able to solve those sorts of problems. Those are really difficult problems, and we've only started to scratch the surface of those problems. Um, and ironically, we've been able to solve things like Go so much e more easily and so much more quickly. And people then say, oh, well, wait a second, it's only a matter of days before you've solved consciousness. <laughs> and that's going to be a long, hard slog. Excellent. Okay, we might, uh, we've got some questions, so I'll uh, hand over to yourself. Um, this is requiring a bit of crystal ball glazing, but I'm interested in when you think, or what you think the lag will be between when a machine achieves consciousness or a sense of self-awareness, and when you think it will be capable of ethical decision making. So are we able to use those cognitive data sets to start teaching morality or ethical decision making now? I ideally, it should be, acting ethically before it's conscious. That would be the right way around to solve this problem. Realistically though? Realistically, we have, no, we have no idea what consciousness is. We have no idea how to build ethical systems. People have just st really st just starting to think about this. I mean, Elon Musk donated $10 million to the Future of Life Institute, which I mentioned earlier, to fund some research grants to, to start people. And people in the field are starting to think about it. And in 50 or 100 years' time, we must have solved this problem. And one of the reasons is that a lot of our ethics and, and our, the basis of our ethics is our body. And so we can empathize with each other and, and, and sort of put ourselves in other people's shoes and say, well, you know, how would I feel about that? And, you know, is that ethical or not? And that's helpful for us to just figure out those very difficult ethical questions. Uh, but a robot will have a very, very different body and an entirely different experience. So a famous philosopher said, you know, if a, if a lion could speak, what would he say? It, it, it's just uh, sort of incomprehensible to even imagine what an ethical robot would need to do. But, but ethics has to be solved almost today. I mean, t I think it was this morning that uh, in the US, it's been ruled that uh, the Google car is being driven uh, by the computer, and the computer is gonna be responsible. So we're already putting computers in life or death situations, and we have to work out you know, who's responsible, how they're gonna behave ethically. And that's before we solve, you know, get into the theory of mind, consciousness, all these other things. We're building autonomous systems that are stupid. They're gonna to have to act ethically very soon. But I, I liked uh, Joanna's point early on, and it, it's sort of, a, it's a collaboration. So if an autonomous vehicle's driving around the streets and there are you know, human pedestrians, whether the human uh, pedestrian decides to cross the road or not is sort of a contract between that autonomous car and the pedestrian, you know, because they're sizing up all the signals that the car's sending out and the pedestrian's got to figure out if the car has actually seen them or not. And I mean, there's a lot to unpack. Uh, and I think there's, there's a hybrid world here, right? There's the hybrid world between rules-based systems and probabilistic systems. And, and a lot of the world of artificial intelligence is actually probabilistic. 
And if you can put together the world of rules, which has an ethics flavor, with the world of probability, you've got to be able to teach and train these systems. So the probability that the pedestrian leaps off the pavement in front of the car, the, the car can't predict that, right? It can calculate the probabilities, but the determinism of what happens is something that's very hard to predict. And so I think you'll see a hybrid world of rule-based and probabilistic systems for some time to come. Sorry, Anne, do you see a role for the law there in mandating some sort of framework for decision-making? Yeah, well, I mean, the law rarely leads. The law is usually trying to catch up all yeah. the time in technology. And I think, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't see, I think uh, lawyers are, are definitely considering these things and certainly uh, the agency that's just approved uh, the, the concept that a, a car system can be the driver uh, has just, be, you know, sort of opened up that uh, debate because a lot of people have come out and said, well, that, it's fine to say that, but the law doesn't actually reflect that at all. Well, was, well, I think the real challenge here is that the technology is just way ahead of the curve here. And people, uh, companies like Google are they're playing a bit, a bit dirty, really, by, by pushing it out there and, and hoping that society is going to catch up quickly enough. You know, taking the uh, driving wheel out of the Google car was a provocative move to precipitate these sorts of changes. Mm. And I think one of the drivers as well, from what I understand with the autonomous vehicles, was um, the insurance companies didn't know, you know who was going to be at fault. So the car companies, it's in their interest to get autonomous vehicles on the road. So they were willing to suck up the, the, the sort of the, the commercial side of it. So it, It's going to be a great boom. A thousand people will die this year on the roads of Australia in road accidents. When we have autonomous vehicles, in under 20 years, when we will have autonomous vehicles, that, de that number will be single digits. We'll look well, back um, and think it was the Wild West back then. Well, he Heath from Te Tesla will be happy to hear that. Uh, so. And it will be great. Each of those road accidents cost the economy a million dollars. Just in, just in dealing with the accident. That's a, that's a billion dollar friction on the economy and a huge amount of personal tragedy to all those families involved. We will look back and say, why did we put up with that? Technology will solve that problem. But we have to work out, you know, how the law companies, are, how, the, how the insurance companies and the lawyers are going to deal with the situation, but it will be a great benefit to mankind when we have autonomous cars. I mean, one, one of the uh, sort of par parts in the transition that there's not enough, enough attention to, and that is when we've got autonomous vehicles and human-driven vehicles all driving in the road all at the same time. That's going to be very hard, so... Yeah. We have another, another question. Cool. Um, so I build robotics in my time, kind of amateur thing, nothing anywhere near what you guys might be interacting with. But um, one of the problems I keep coming up against is that everything's conditional. So I'm using if statements and switch statements. Um, and many of my friends who play with similar things have kind of postulated over large amounts of alcohol that the, at the end of the cycle of, you know, pattern recognition, conditional logic, the real difference between a computer that, that is intelligent and um, sort of where it needs to be is desire. So, you know, what would your thoughts be on actually engineering a computer that desires something, that actually wants to learn, rather than is just simply told to? It's actually pretty easy to give a robot um, a desire, a goal. They're, they're pretty goal-driven machines, okay? But if you th look at it that way, I mean, can I, I, whenever I have these doubts or, or complex... Uh, Thoughts. I just look at the nearest person next to me and think, well, there's proof of concept. So, uh, you know, <laughs> if you look down into Toby, if we put him under the microscope and kept sort of, uh, yes, uh, magnifying and magnifying, you know, we'd be down to just uh, atoms. And so it's all just chemical reactions, right? So there's just no reason why we're not going to get there with a different kind of technology. I guess there's a slight addendum. Um if you, what are your thoughts on instead of creating machines that solve tasks to create first class citizens? Like peers? I didn't so, quite hear the question. I'm not so sure I understand to, the question. Yeah, I will, so uh, I actually asked this in an earlier discussion on AI, but all of the artificial intelligence that we uh, seem to be investing in, at least from my limited perspective, are machines that solve very specific tasks. 
and people are always scared of being replaced by machines that do tasks. But I wonder if it's a situation that, you know, maybe the idea is actually to generate peers, so first class citizens. Not something that does something for you, but something that works with you. I just want to There's a huge that. movement uh, around something called co robotics, where you know, robots actually help people build things in, in factories. Uh, there's an, a big DARPA competition in the US to build a sort of a, a humanoid that can drive a car. And there's been a bit of a shift in robotics from these specialized machines. You know, we don't want an appliance for everything. We actually want a partner who can help us do things. So rather than build the car that can drive itself, you know, uh, build a humanoid that can drive your car and go, go to the kindergarten, pick up the kids, or change the diaper or feed granny. So I, I, I'm gonna defend the reductionist approach of, of a lot of science, right? So the reason we, we solve particular tasks in AI is because that's how we've solved lots of problems in science. We you know, break it down into parts and we solve the individual parts. It's a really interesting question. It's not just a, uh, you know, it's a pretty philosophical question whether that is the way we're gonna solve intelligence or not. Um, it's you know, a useful strategy that's worked in many other domains. Um, it worked in aeronautics, for example. That's, that's how we worked out how to fly. Uh, we broke the problem down into parts, we solved the problem, and we fly in a completely different way than, uh, than birds do. We didn't walk around and say, okay, well, we gotta just, gotta learn how to fly like those baby birds do over there. Uh, I think we'd still be walking around flapping our hands. <laughs> um, I think we've got time for one more question based on the time available. Um, one, one more question over here. Hi. Uh, I just had a question for Toby. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, two questions. Uh, one is, is your skepticism of AI becoming autonomous or sentient based on the current method of programming in robotics? And uh, two, with quantum computing technologies making, or potentially making current tech obsolete, uh, do you see it becoming a, change, a game changer in your philosophical views? Uh, I'm not sure I'm as, as skeptic about uh, systems becoming autonomous. I'm just concerned well, about the dangers. Uh, well, so I'm, uh, I'm concerned about the dangers of giving autonomy to systems. As for sentience, um, you know, it's not cl not clear to me what sentience is and, and where. You know, it seems to. Me, I suspect it, there's, there's, it's, a, it's it's not a black or white thing. There's many shades of grey, and in some sense, we already have slightly sentient systems, and they'll get slightly more sentient as we go on. And in regards to the second question. Quantum computing, well, I, I, I don't think it should be a question just for me. Yeah, I think yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. Again, Australia punches well above its weight in, in quantum computing, um, and uh, lots of your taxpayer dollars are now being thrown at uh, even more of that. So um, uh, hopefully it's going to be an interesting part of that future. Except quantum computing is not going to uh, supersede ordinary computing. I mean, quantum computing is very specialized, and as far as we know, we can only use quantum you know, algorithms, if we can all even call them that, for uh, specific tasks like factorization, which means that's going to have a big impact on uh, cyber security. But in terms of, uh, you know, general computing, I think the, uh, the impact of quantum might be much more limited. Well, I think it's, again, like the discussion with neuromorphic computing, quantum computing, brain-inspired computer architectures. Each one of these will have a role in this hybrid world of compute infrastructure. And, and the quantum world is going to be really good at a certain set of anomaly detection uh, opportunities in the same way that a neuromorphic might be good at pattern recognition. Um, the interesting thing about quantum, right, is that over the last 18 months to two years, we've seen significant advances in the ability to get to a, a nine qubit computation. So the, the quantum world is advancing very rapidly and I think we'll get to a threshold with quantum computing where we'll start to see real opportunities in how we can program systems to take advantage of, of the, the quantum computer in the same way that we can take advantage of a neuromorphic computer. But I think it'll be special purpose. It won't be general purpose replacing all computation as we know it. Actually, I suspect that one of the biggest areas for quantum will be quantum cryptography. Sorry, the, say that again. Quantum please. cryptography. Oh, okay. the, the fact that you can actually see whether your, your signal has been uh, compromised. You'll actually, you know, once it's observed, been observed by someone else, the, the wave function collapses, you can tell that someone else has read the signal. 
So that actually is, I suspect, going to be you know, one of the more, com yeah. more commercial aspects of, of quantum, certainly in the short term. Right, and, and like with quantum, right, both quantum and neuromorphic, ultimately these become real technologies when you can instantiate them in silicon. And I think we're now at the point that we're seeing real systems being built uh, with commercial fabrication technology so we can get to a world where we can experiment with these new systems. Quantum blockchain, that's what I'm waiting for. Well, blockchain's a whole different topic. That's <laughs> next year's discussion. <laughs> next, next, next topic. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much. Can everyone please put their hands together for our three great speakers?